Right, you know, when we first met at Buckland Hall, we found ourselves having dinner together and we talked about our shared love of Rumi's poetry. And you told me that you love to, to write poetry. And then in the celebration evening at the end of the retreat, you read some of your poems. And that was just the start of many memorable poetry readings at subsequent retreats. So it's lovely to have the opportunity to talk about your poetry with you and share it with a much wider audience. So, so tell me first, how did your love of poetry come about? <clears throat> was that in childhood or was it later on? Thank you, Jenny, for, for today. I love being able to discuss poetry and especially with someone who shares the same interest. Um, my love for poetry definitely came along later on in life. Actually, um, school was very much scientific and, you know, whatever poetry I did do was very kind of Second World War and whatever I had to do for GCSE. So I didn't, and that, that wasn't the sort of poetry that I fell in love with. And my real love for poetry came along in quite late, actually in my 30s, and was definitely because of Rumi. Um, and I happened to come across his poems, I think, through little quotes that I found on the internet and then started reading more and more and more. And his words touched me in a way that no words before had ever touched me. Um, and I think the journey really started there by falling in love with his poems and then the, the writing of the po poetry, writing my own, came a little bit later. So there, there was definitely falling in love with him first before I understood what it might mean for me. So as well as the <clears throat> the love of his poetry, his, his poetry is is very much about uh, the spiritual journey, isn't it? Um, mm. So had you already uh, taken an interest in, in spirituality at that at that point? Yes, um, I, I had. I'm, you know, I'm I'm Indian, and so brought up in a very Hindu household. It's such a an integrated part of how we live, uh, Hinduism and our culture. But I hadn't really understood the depths of what was being pointed at. Um, I, I had in my late twenties uh, gone to uh, some Vedanta classes. I would now look back and call them quite strict for them. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, at the time I enjoyed them. I enjoyed the exploration with people of my age who were interested in going just a little bit underneath the surface. And it was so important for me to have done that. But when, when I read Rumi, there was a softening in my heart that had never happened with what I'd studied before. I think what I'd studied, I'd made into, you know, an academic subject because that's mm -hmm. what I knew. And with Rumi, he would talk about the body and he would talk about love and his, you know, there, there'd just be one or two lines that would just catch me and drop me somewhere else. And I didn't know and, or understand what that was at the time, but I knew that there was something there, um, something much deeper. and. I was struck by how, you know, just a collection of maybe six or seven words could be so, um, so transformative in the sense that they would take me from words in my mind, but to somewhere else, you know, some, some kind of much more dispersed place, you know, so for example, there's this lovely line that I love of Rumi's, which is, um, lovers never really meet they're in each other all along I, it's so beautiful it's so beautiful and um i i remember once at a at a meeting with rupert in hampstead i, I hadn't understood what that meant actually so i wanted to ask him and it was i think the first time that he'd heard it and he said also oh that's so beautiful, repeat it again to me. <laughs> so I said it, I, you know, I repeated it again. I said, but what does it really mean? And then, and then he explained, and of course I understand now, but it's so beautiful, it's so profound. It can be so powerful to 
remember and connect with that when we're when we're when we're with other people yes yes and very different from the uh, Vedanta teaching which you'd been studying yes, yes which is uh, uh, a lot more intellectual and um, cold, can be colder in a way, can't it? Yes, it, it can be. And um, with, with Rumi, there was such an integration and inclusiveness of the body and love and all of the different ways that love can be expressed, which, which of course is also between two people and, you know, the sensual love. And yeah. Rumi's poems can be read I think at different levels they can be read at the sensual level and of course he also talks about the love for the divine which was something that I, I, I learned to appreciate it wasn't obvious to me at the beginning um, so he opened that door for me you know this 13th century poet who I'm in love with <laughs> <laughs> yes yes so how did you come to start writing poetry? Uh, the, this came about a little bit by itself and there are, there are two lovely stories um, around this. Um, I, was living in, I was living in Italy at the time and um, um, I had gone with a friend who was American to Venice for carnival. I'd never been before for carnival. And so we'd gone together and my Italian was, was slightly better than hers. So I was a bit more um, adventurous about going into shops and, you know, striking conversations and so forth. So we were kind of wandering around. And I remember we came across this, this shop that was, um, that was owned by an artisanal um, paper maker so he had he made everything in that shop you know he made the paper from 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 its components and in the window was this necklace and it was a necklace with tiny bits of paper hanging from it so rather than beads there were these bits of paper and uh, you could just about see that the the writing you know the tiny writing on the paper were little love poems and I was so taken by by this that I said oh let's go inside and let's go and talk to him and find out and also let's find out how much this necklace is and you know I went in and he he was so pleased at seeing us you know these two young young non-italian looking women I think <laughs> coming into his shop and his name's Fernando actually we struck up a friendship and uh, he told me about the necklace which you know, I did ask how much it was and I couldn't afford it but actually I was much more interested in who had written the poems and how he put this together so he told me a little bit and then he said you know that the person who wrote the poems is a friend of mine would you like to would you like to meet him and I said oh of course I mean a slightly unusual <laughs> <laughs> offering but I just you know I was we were in that mood we were taken so he said yes of course so he called his friend and wasn't able to get through and was slightly disappointed and he said you know don't worry um leave me your address and I will send you one of his books when I I'll get one for you and I'll send it to you. And I, I left my address and I thanked him. And then he said, but there is a bookshop on the other side of the island. And another friend of mine um, runs this shop. And let me see if there are, there's a, a copy of one of his other books there for you. So he called his friend and said, you know, do you have this copy? And his friend said, yes. And he said, look, I'm sending these two young women over to you. And uh, we said, thank you and off we went and sometimes when you know people offer you things the universe happens and these things some, sometimes get to somewhere and sometimes they don't anyway we kind of made our way to the other side of the island to this shop and the shop was the most italian looking thing that you you'll find even in a place like venice you know there was there were two tall slightly thin men with thick black glasses, one smoking a cigarette and the other in the corner, the other one reading a newspaper and, you know, filled with books from, from the floor to the top. And you could smell that kind of odor mm. or perfume of old books. And so we kind of, we ventured in uh, 
that perhaps a little shy and he said oh no I've been expecting the two of you come on in <laughs> and then he reached behind him and took out this book and handed it to me and said that's for you and then he looked at my friend and said well you know we can't let you go empty-handed either and he looked on his table and it was carnival so he had a mask a Venetian mask on his table and he handed that to her and said and that's for you and that was you know the the beginning of you know, the, the, I, I guess we could say that the gift of poetry was given to me by by complete strangers. And I don't know why it was an act of love on their part. A few weeks later, the second book arrived from Fernando, um, of this Italian author. And um, so, so that's how I fell in love with the... I guess with the the idea of being even being able to write poems because it was just his friend who was writing this poem and then um, the other thing that happened was that two friends of mine were getting married and they had asked me to say something at their wedding I'd known them from the beginning of their their beautiful romance Raquel and Gonzalo and uh, they were getting married in Portugal and they said oh please will you come and say something during the ceremony and I really wanted to make it special and I wanted to make it just for them and I remember the day when I thought, well, I, I must write something today because time will run out. And I, I looked over at my writing table that was sat next to a big window, you know, in these palazzos in Milan, you have these big windows with the light coming in. And, and I just sat down and I knew I had to write. And some, it was the first time I wrote something. And with them in my heart, so I wrote a poem about them for them, which I read at their wedding and that's how it started other friends asked me also or I would just write something in their wedding cards because it was so personal and and that's how it started initially and then I let go of it actually um, and then it restarted again in 2014 I'd come back to London um, and it started there I think for, for a couple of reasons um, first you you know I, I I fell in love with someone, which was lovely. It's a lovely portal to, mm. to express what's happening. And um, that was also the year that I, I met Rupert. So both of those things really then propelled my, my poems. I don't call them my poems. They're just poems that come to me is what I've also learned um, in, in, a, in a very different direction. Yeah. Yes. So that relationship didn't last I guess no. but the no. poems poems did <laughs> yes the, the poems the poems did the poems do the friendship lasts always mm. as it's a friendship in truth yes and um but you know the falling in love is such a beautiful way of even falling in love with the truth yes yes and in a way that I could never have um, I could never have done so through an intellectual understanding. Mm -hmm. mm. Many of your earlier poems <clears throat> seem to speak of longing, but uh, at the same time, there's a, a recognition that what is longed for is already there. And so Shakti dancing her way to Shiva enjoying the dance but longing for union is, is that is that how you see them yes i i think i think there there probably was some genuine longing and yearning <laughs> 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 and I, I look back and i i, I it, and there's a sweetness to those poems you know it's, yes it's a yes. and a genuine <laughs> innocence of what they were expressing it was because it was true and what I then come, what I then came to understand um, was, yes, the the kind of I call it almost a mirror in a glass. I'm looking for something in a mirror, but actually, I'm looking for something in a, in the glass of someone else. But actually, they're they're a mirror. I'm looking for myself, and that looking is from the place of that that's already here. So there's no looking. You know, this game of hide and seek, which is which also inspired a poem um and and that's a that's an understanding that continues to deepen but i don't think it would again have come about 
had it not been through a little bit the exploration of the poems or indeed the understanding of of love through the lens of non-duality yes yeah So would you like to read one of those uh, earlier poems? Yes. Um, I will read, actually it's one of my favorites and um, it's about me. So maybe that's why I like it. But when I say it's about me, you know, I also think it's about all of us in that way. Um, it's called This Utopian Chance. She doesn't know, but the sky drapes itself around her like a sari, and the stars yearn to hang from her ears. The winds long to sail adrift in her breath, and the monsoon rains to taste her sweetened tears. The sands of the Thar continually ask her for her glow, but she hasn't yet learnt to hear their prayer and what of the liquid sparkle of the sun that tickles the ocean's waves? It wants nothing but to caress her hair. The red petals of every rose want to be crushed into a powder, just to sit close to her by pretending to be Sindur. And every bell in every temple awaits to be struck when her heart beats, to feel her rhythm. Such is her unbeknownst to her allure. The oceans too that stretch from one lifetime to the next condense themselves into a single drop waiting from her just one kiss. But she doesn't know for her heart is clouded with clouds and thoughts of an illusory past miss. If only she knew that the moon wakes early every night to bring her a message from that hidden stellate sun. But she doesn't know, for her eyes are still covered by a mask, a mask of desires after which her tides still run. And then what of the emeralds of Aurora, the circle of lights skating across the skies, asking for her hand to dance? But she doesn't know, for her ears don't hear the music, even though for her it is sung. Oh, how long will she let slip this utopian chance? That's beautiful. Can you remember what the inspiration was that led you to write that poem? It was a while ago now, I guess. Yes, I I, hmm. I can remember where I was when I was writing it. I remember it was I was sitting on my on my sofa and it was raining outside, so there was a tip tap of of the weather and the world just outside, almost as a knocking, <laughs> <laughs> reminding me to say, you know, open open the door that's inside you. Everything is reminding you. And um yeah, I, I can't quite remember more than that, but I, I remember distinctly sitting and I, I also remember that, you know, it's as if there's a place that comes along to meet me and in that place the words come along. Um, because it, it's a very particular poem. I haven't written very many other, I haven't written any other poems with, with the kind of Indian um, references and, and other symbols in there. So it's a particular poem which it's a good reminder of a, of a poem as well, because um, the question that we ask about, do we know, who is, who's asking that question? Um, yes. And, and more and more, I, more and more there is this knowing, you know, it's a, an understanding that, that comes, that's coming 
I can feel that it's coming. And it's a good poem to remind me when I think, oh, I don't understand or I don't know. But I do know, I do know something. Mm. It has a very tantric feel to it, doesn't it? Everything I see, everything I hear, everything I touch is myself and leads me back to myself. Yes, and is inviting me back to myself, yes. asking me. And um, the, you know, the longing and the yearning is, is for me. And like we said at the beginning, lovers never meet, they're in each other all along. Yes. And understanding, understanding that from moment to moment. Um, yes, it has a it has this sensing element to it. You know, it, I love that it incorporates the body. Yes, yes. Mm. So has the has the meaning of the word love changed for you, do you think, over the time from when you wrote the, those earlier poems to, to now? Yes, I, I, I think so. And the, I think the poems can almost chronicle that change. Um, yes. some, of the, some of the poems before this utopian chance. No, around that time, actually, they were quite sticky. There was a, there was a real sense. You, you could feel the yearning and depths of yes. longing <laughs> in them. <laughs> Definitely. Um, <laughs> and you know, <laughs> and and that's become. It's become much more subtle now. I think mm -hmm. um, there's an understanding of the impersonal nature of love, the more inclusive, dispersive sense of it. And um, um, I, 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 it, it's taken its own time to get, you know, to get there. I, I don't think there's anything that I do. I don't sit at the beginning and decide this is the sort of poem it will be. They, that's how they just come along. And for me, the the way they come along end up being a teaching to me about, or um, give me deeper insights about where I am. Um, Sounds almost like the the Jungian idea of um, things from the, the subconscious come to us in dreams and um, those dreams um, tell us something, not all dreams, but some dreams, mm. special dreams. So maybe your, your poems come from that same sort of place. Yeah, I, I don't know where they come from, Jenny. And I, mm. it's so, I, it's they are the first um they're the first channel that made me understand that i'm a channel in some ways i don't mm. know where they come from i don't know what the poem will lead to i don't know how it will start i don't know how it will finish i'm the last to know the title of the poem always mm -hmm. and um when I go back and read them, you know, if I haven't looked at them for months or a few years, it's as if I'm reading them for the first time. And um, that can only, you know, I, I think what I take from that is that they visit me, yes. they're not mine. And, um, and that's also why I want to share them because they were shared with me, like the books were gifted to me in Venice. And so, I love to be able to share them with with others, and it's yeah. nice. It's in that same in, in that way that it's nice also not to feel a sense of ownership of them. They're free. They have their own life, and I just need to help them to be free. Yes. Some of your love poems uh, refer to a a you. Uh, who are who are they really addressed to? So I, I think the, 
much like Rumi, where he would start off, you know, talking about Shams. Actually, he was talking to the divine you, which is divine us, divine me. Yeah. And um, um, eventually that's where, that's where I, I like to leave the poem, but I also like to leave a bit of ambiguity in the sense that um, it's nice to leave people with that question. <laughs> yes. you know, it's nice yes. not to conclude mm. something at the end of a poem because I think it 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 creates a space for for people to fall between the words and the lines and um, answer that question for themselves. I think there's something lovely about poems, unlike you know a textbook or an article because there's a relationship that can happen between the words sitting on a page and the person who wrote them and the person that's reading them and the ambiguity in the space allows for some kind of i think sinking into where the, where the where the words came from you know there's there's a different yeah. sort of bridge um I, I don't know if that happens with my poems, but certainly when I read Hafiz or Rumi, that's that's where I end up. Yes, it, uh, I think it. I think it happens well. I, I certainly find it happens with all poems that that, that come from uh, from that place of of knowing, and they they take you back there because they're not something you can reason with they take you beyond the reasoning mind don't they um, yeah and and the other thing about poems is you know you can, much like in a night dream in a night's dream anything is possible in that dream there's no there are no limits to what one can write about you know that there's a sense of possibility and potential and um you know in, in a poem you can almost stitch together concepts or ideas that the universe is yet to come up with although not quite <laughs> true but almost on yes. that edge in that you know it can it, it's such an adventure <laughs> And I, I was going to say, sorry, that it, it's such an adventure, but one that um, that they take me on. It's and and I I I learned that at the beginning. In that um, you know, I would have spells where the poems just wouldn't come, and there would be you know, I would then look up writer's block. What does that mean? You know, I, I took a very mechanical approach to it. And I think because of my understanding of non-duality, my approach became much more of, um, I just need to collaborate and um, create space and it's up to them when they come, they come. And when they don't come, that's also, that's fine. You know, there's, there's some pregnation somewhere and, and in time they always do. Um, and that sense of anxiety is no longer there because they're, they're not mine. That's the beauty of them. They come mm -hmm. through like, like birds coming to a waterfall. You know, I need to put the water outside and sometimes they'll come and I'll see them. And sometimes they'll come and I won't see them. Um, and that's also something that I think Rupert in a really beautiful way taught me. Yes. So in, in 2017, you published your first book of poems, um, uh, this one, Fall in Love with Love with Me. Where, where did that title come from? <laughs> <laughs> oh, Jenny, I wish I knew where that title came from because I'm, I'm, I'm searching for a second title of my book and I know it will just come when it comes. Um, but I, I just don't know. And it's a lovely thing to not know. Um, yes. 
<laughs> but when it did come, I did know that it was the perfect title for yes. the sorts of poems that I write because um, it, if you read it the first time, it's not always clear, fall in love with love, with me. Mm -hmm. And it has this kind of circularity uh, to it and the distinction between the little love and the big love. And, you know, ultimately the big love with me, i.e. with yourself also. Um, so it, it, I, I don't know, but it's, I, I agree, it's beautiful. And, and again, this is where I understand that these things just come, you know, they're yes. a part of, they're a part of the universe that, that, that's just somehow coming to greet me. And I see their beauty, but it's not mine. It's not something I own. And I feel very lucky that they become. Yes. Um, mm. <laughs> so shall we go on to the next poem, which, uh, which comes from that book? Yes. So I, I have um, I have lots of poems about eyes in this book, but uh, I think this was the first poem that I wrote about eyes and it's called Dance of the Iris. The Dance of the Iris, sight muted, eclipsed by a collapse of everything into a pulse, blue to blue and back dilating ever so, a dance of the iris and breath in time with a metronome that knows no time, no place, and us lying in between the lines of a stave as instruments porous to the music that pervades and embraces us back to life. That's perfect. We had to include a, a poem of our size, given your fascination with us. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. And it's and, such, such a lovely image lying in between the lines of a stave. Beautiful. And I think my fascination about the eyes also comes in some way from Rumi. I'm sure I read at the beginning about his practice of gazing with with shams and um and m my fascination with the eyes is that with um not with everyone because i'm not sure everyone's open to it but with certainly with people who are open to it just the simple act of a soft continued gaze into the other is so profound it's so deep um in that there's a forgetting for me um and um i mean th th this poem was written you know for, the, for 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 that lovely person i fell in love with blue to blue and back you know when i was looking into eye, his eyes from one eye to the other and back and his iris dilating all by itself, as I'm sure mine was as well. And this dance that would happen <laughs> between our two irises that we, we, we didn't know what it was in time to, maybe in time to our breath, but to this kind of universal metronome that has no place, is in eternity. And, you know, the kind of, I think there's a um, there's a sense of nakedness that comes about after gazing because all that's left is some kind of gaze that goes beyond beyond the eyes and and that's and and, and that's why for me that line lying in between the lines of a stave so you know outside of the structure it, it, somewhere else where where the music is that that breathes into us and pervades us and embraces us and brings us back to this life. So that's where the poem came from. And it's another one of those poems that if I haven't read in a while, you know, I look at it and 
it's a, it's a beautiful reminder of you know lovely moments <laughs> yes yes have you ever been to one of mother mira's darshans as she looks into your eyes oh, it's no. very very beautiful it's really lovely oh i've heard of her yes. i've heard of her mm. yes mm. Something for me to think about. Mm. Yes. So this last year has been a, a very different year for all, all of us and for, for many people, a very difficult one. And I, I remember during the first lockdown in the UK, you sent me a set of COVID poems and they were so evocative of your experience during that time of very severe restrictions. And I, I, I sort of had expected, I suppose, that um, your impulse to write poetry might have dried up as a result of that, but not at all. It seemed to have flowered. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I also remember having the thought at the beginning of March um, during COVID that, oh, you know, work's going to become very difficult, perhaps mm -hmm. traumatic. And I don't tend to dwell when I write. I don't tend to dwell or write from that place. And mm -hmm. I do remember thinking it would be interesting to see if anything comes up at all, um, because these are going to be uh, very difficult times for everyone and um, mm. what ended up happening was that um, in, in some ways because of the restrictions <laughs> I suddenly had all of this time in the evenings to myself <sighs> and I have this blue velvet sofa which to me is like you know me being in a boat floating on my ocean in my lounge and I I would just sit there with my computer and see what see if anything would come out and some very interesting things came out some explored um, uh, my own symptoms actually at the beginning when I lost my sense of smell and wasn't at all unwell but how I noticed that some explored um, I guess with the with the quietening of the busyness of life and the slowing down of things I would just notice things a bit more and appreciate them a little mm. bit more and um, and uh, I think the other thing that came about in that time was I started to do yoga and started to incorporate yoga into my <laughs> you know yoga poses into my yes. poems or or I started to learn French and incorporate a word or two into my poem. So, yes, it was unexpected. And um, um, I think maybe having less busyness and more time to notice and to be still on, on my blue ocean and all sorts of really different poems came along during that time, yeah. I think what struck me about your COVID poems was the that common theme of enjoyment and appreciation of ordinary experiences that would normally just pass us by. But that's, um, when we don't resist the, the situation, then it, they just come to the surface and we, we see things we wouldn't otherwise see. Ordinary experiences become, become extraordinary. Mm. And that, that theme seemed to come through an awful lot of your COVID poems. Mm. No, it, it's true. I I started seeing the loveliness of lettuce. And, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and the miracle of yeast and how is it that you mix some yeast and some sugar and some water and some flour and then you put it somewhere warm after a little bit of processing in between, but it it rises and makes food that's edible. It makes bread. It was miraculous. Um, um, and then also at that time it was spring and, you know, then we had such a gorgeous summer. And 
to 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 really accompany the seasons and to allow them to come into my everyday and to really notice them. They were so different, you know, when we're busying around, commuting, running from here to there. Um, we, we miss out on this miracle that surrounds us um, from the most minute, you know, I started planting seeds. Jenny, perhaps inspired a little bit by you. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, three weeks later, there'd be these, these plants coming out from my pots that were giving me leaves of Thai basil and other things. Or, and so from that side to the other, where I think this year, um, this year, at some point of the year, Venus was very close and um, my my father we got him a telescope for father's day and we saw the moons of venus through this telescope mm. and yes it's through the telescope but to see the moons of another planet in our yes. solar system with my bare <laughs> eyes you know just even on that level you know we're surrounded by this you know, we're, we're surrounded by godliness if we if we can just see it it's just it's there it's here i have a glass of water sitting in front of me how comes water is transparent what what is it how does it move you know it's so ordinary but it contains i i guess all of life's mysteries you know in something something so ordinary and I started to see much more of that because yes. of this year yeah so would you like to read one of those poems yes so um this is a uh, this is a poem uh from springtime and um I, I remember I wrote it after I'd been out for a run and I'd been busying myself, I don't know what, listening maybe to something on my headphones. And uh, out of nowhere, I just saw this, this branch with a pink blossom and it, it arrested me. I stopped, I had to stop. And, and so this poem then came about after that. It's called The Deadliest of Moments. The Deadliest of Moments are those when we forget to live, when we lose the ability to be arrested by the wondrous layers of blossom on a branch, reaching out to you, reminding you. Pink, paper thin petals propelling themselves out from the sleek barked branches. What sort of miracle is this? What sort of miracles are these in every springtime? So next time your stride is hurried, trying to reach somewhere a little faster, allow the little miracles of life to meet you here, where you always are, in between strides, living the true moments of your own miraculous life. beautiful mm -hmm. and you know it, it still I, I still it still surprises me how can how is it that a bark that has this hard woody surface to it or you look at a tree that looks so solid and um how, how do these soft almost embryonic petals come out of something that if you looked at it and you didn't know that spring can come out of a tree like this that it could produce something so different and so beautiful you know it's a miracle it is <laughs> <laughs> I, I remember when um when I was studying um we were doing I, I don't know physiology or something in the first year of university 
and um, as you studied medicine didn't you yes 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 yes, during the first year of medicine and we we were learning about the simple human cell and Jenny the there's a book called the cell and it is about that big so that's two and a half inches big wow (laughs) (laughs) So, so there are these you know micro we there are there are these micro micro quantum universes everywhere you know at the at the micro level and at the macro level it's it's I mean it's a miracle it's it's a miracle um and it's here it's here it's always been here yes when when I'm not busying (laughs) yes Many of your your poems have <clears throat> these lovely musical qualities, so the the raw sounds <clears throat> of the words, not the meaning of the words, just the raw sounds of the words, and uh, and the rhythm. Um, that they they need to be heard as well as read. Um, when I read them. I, I do sound them slowly in my head. It's not how I normally read yeah. with your poems. That's, that's what I do. And is that, is that what you intend or do you think everyone reads them differently? Mm, um, I think some of them I definitely intend that way, um, especially when I've chosen chosen words very rarely do I choose words they often just come along but sometimes I'm struck by a beautiful word and then I wait and wait and then it will just turn up in a poem um but I would say that's pretty rare um I think the poems do them on their own Jenny there are some poems that that want to speak to you directly and some that will that are happy being read um yeah, I don't know. I'll ask them next time. <laughs> I, I have been struck by a beautiful word, two beautiful words this week. One, one's an English word, and I'd never heard it before. Called it's viridescence. Wow, what viridescence. does that mean? <laughs> it, it's to do with green, the greenness of something. It's such a beautiful word. It's almost a jewel. You know, you yes. could imagine uh, more, more beautiful than a jewel so that that will I'm sure make its way and the other word that I heard which was a French word um, and I, I, I love how it plays with the mouth when the word comes out and the word is inoubliable oh. which means um, unforgettable yes inoubliable mm-hmm. It's beautiful. Yes, it is. So shall we have one last poem that that highlights that musical quality? Yes. So this this, um, poem is called Scintilla. Scintilla, dots, brownian in their motion, breath-like in their notion, lifted, afloat, happily asleep, sweetly drunk, on their own twilight, dissolving, resolving, a question evolving, into its own awakened answer, scintillating still, a near distant star, Morse code pulses that only you can know as me saying yes. That's amazing. Yeah. But where did where did that poem come from? This poem came um Actually, in the last couple of months, I've been sitting a, a lot more. So that's the other thing because of 
COVID that mm. being able to, and I want to sit and it's lovely to, to want to sit. And um, uh, what I've been finding in my sitting is that there's this kind of hovering that happens of, of my body in terms of my body sensations. And there's almost an on off, you know, sometimes there's a sensing of a certain part of the body and then I can't, and then it's there and then I can't. And mm -hmm. it kind of moves around a little bit like a constellation of stars that are, that are, that are, that, that, that twinkle in, in, in their own rhythm. And so um, it, it, it reminded me of the almost scintillating constellatory nature of the body when we sit and uh, the poem came about very much after you know a, a, a meditation um, and you know this this bit at the end about the, the morse code pulses are the twinkles that come mm -hmm. and go um, that only you can know as me saying yes and again it there's some ambiguity there for people if they wish it, but really it's quite clear, I think, that yes. The, the, the yes is, it, the me saying yes is to myself. That's really the, the contrast between the <clears throat> discontinuous nature of phenomena and that continuous background of awareness within which they are, arise and which you say yes to. Mm, yeah. Mm. yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and the, the poems that are coming now are very, very much associated with what happens during sitting. You know, they have a different quality to them now. Yes. Um, and I, I think if I were to put my poems in order, they could pretty much chart my, um, my, my path almost, you know, the, the widening rings of being that Rumi talks about. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Do you ever revisit your, uh, your poems and make changes? Um, I, I, I stopped revisiting the very early ones. The very early ones were, you know, always rhythm written in, in, in rhyme. And I, they were so, they were so love filled, you know, they were filled with honey and dew that um, I, I've moved on from there. So there are some that I, I, I do go back to and I, I tweak because I'd like to put them into maybe the next book. But, but many, I think, just need to stay where they are. You know, they taught me something and I'm thankful. Um, with, with, with my poems, it's interesting. Like I said, you know, they, they come along on their own and I don't always know if I'm, I don't know how they're going to finish or even if indeed I'm able to finish them. So I've learned never to force a poem. If, if it doesn't feel like it's coming, it's fine. I, I leave it and I'll go back. And I'll, I'll go back whenever, you know, there isn't a timetable that I set. <laughs> and um, often a very different or surprising ending will, will come along. Um, yeah, I, I, <laughs> I have a very, I've developed this really free attitude towards them now. Um, So, so I do go back. I do go back. Sometimes they, they when when they come, they're they're fully formed, and I never reject anything. So everything that comes to me, it gets saved somewhere. It doesn't mean it always is shared in the form in a book or or with others. But I I don't I don't say no to anything. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, they're such a wonderful teaching themselves. Yes, yes. So you've you said there'll be another another book. When when do you think that's going to come about? <clears throat> I I hope I well no I think next year. I said this year, but it will be next year now. Mm -hmm. um, I've started to started to try and put the 
some of the poems together. Um, the, the, I await the title. <laughs> and I, and I, I don't know I, I remember I remember once I visited you Jenny and you gave me this paper called the uncountability of real numbers do you remember that <laughs> I remember that it's my favorite mathematical theorem <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it, it left me with oh what would this be like as a title the uncountability of real love <sighs> Beautiful. So I'm toying with that. And another one that actually interestingly came yesterday when, when we were sitting, it's a very simple title and very different to this one, was um, Shades of Me in Shades of You. Um, so I, I don't know. They, you know, something will tell me, they will tell me, um, but... I'm also astonished by the number of poems that are there now. So, yeah, they, they, the, the titles and the poems will meet and the book will somehow come about, I hope next year. Yeah, I think next year. <laughs> well, I look forward to, to that. Well, yeah. Thank you, Rachna. As, as always, I've enjoyed talking you, with you very much. Oh, thank you so much, Annie. I always love talking with you and when we meet gazing into your eyes so thank you for that so thank you